I am your brother Joseph. And he kissed all of his brothers, and he wept upon them. And after that, all of his brothers talked with him. All right, cue the soaring, hopeful music, because everybody's hugging, and the credits are going to roll, and you know maybe we'll even get one of those dance parties going on behind the scenes there. But this is the end of the story. Does, does it sort of feel like we missed the entire movie? <laughs> That's because we did. <laughs> For starters, we didn't do the um, other reading that comes from the Joseph cycle last Sunday. We did Noah's Ark for wonderful and important reasons. Um, but also the lectionary really only gives us tiny, tiny piece of what is this more or less a novella that is the, the end, the full <coughs> ending and closure of the book of Genesis, the whole story of Joseph. It's a huge story, and it's really important to the entire narrative of Genesis, not to mention the journey that we've been on this summer, starting back with Abraham and Sarah in June. So I thought maybe we would just sort of take a few minutes to to make sure that we catch the whole story. And I have um, a little help from Steve. He's going to pull up some pictures on the screen. So if, if you can people see the screen, I hope you can see the screen. Oh, if you click the little green dot in the corner, Back guy. All right. They, they make it so small you can hardly see it. Go ahead and click it. Ta-da. There we go. All right. So I have um, gathered up some classic art. And the pictures are on the table, so you can look at them afterwards. Um, but we're just going to sort of take a few minutes to see if we remember the whole story of Joseph. So Joseph starts out with kind of a key setting. Um, how big is Joseph's family? How many brothers are there total? Twelve. That's a lot of brothers, right? There's also, a, a, I think there's a sister, at least one. Anyway, that's a lot of kids competing for attention from dad and mom and mom. Because remember that, um, that Jacob, Joseph's father, has two wives. And this object is a symbol of kind of some of the family dynamics. Does anyone know what this is? Code or dream coat? Yeah, that's right. It's the coat or, or sometimes we think of it as the technicolor dream coat, right? The coat <laughs> many colors. And it's kind of a symbol of um, Joseph's position in the family because he's what? The favorite son. The favorite son. You know, I'm going to do this so that the people online can see too. There we go. I don't want to miss you guys. <laughs> so Joseph's the favorite son. And what is this set up? Jealousy. There's a lot of jealousy in this family because every parent who's got more than one kid knows <laughs> this is not a recipe for family harmony, right? All right, let's go ahead and switch to the next picture. Here. Oh, did that work? You see you're not in the control there. Oh, OK. Oh dear. Oh, come back. I, we will. <laughs> Oops. Oh, click resume chair. That's what we have to do. Yeah. We have to have control of preview, which is why. Ta-da! You're the best. I couldn't do this without Steve. <laughs> All right, so um, it gets better because here's, this is Rembrandt. It's a sketch. And here's Joseph, and he is lecturing his family because he's had something special happen. Does anyone remember what it was? Dreams. Dreams. And in those dreams, what do they tell him that he's explaining to his family? Listen. Yeah, someday. The famine one comes later, but in this case, it's that someday 
I'm going to be in charge. <laughs> because there's, there's all these sheaves of wheat, and they are all bowing down to Joseph's sheaf of wheat, and there's stars and suns and moons, and they are all circled around the center of attention. I'm the most important. <laughs> so what happens? Does not go well, down well. And so, there's a plot. What do they do? This is the bit we missed last week, by the way. They sell? That's right. They sell him. They, they, they kind of, they have, of course, a lot of brothers. I think there were um, 10 of them there, if I'm not right. Anyway, a lot of brothers. They have a little argument. Some of them want to kill him. Some of them want to leave him behind in a well, but at the end, they end up selling him to a trader who's going off to Egypt. And so Joseph ends up in Egypt, and then what do they tell Dad? Yeah, this is, okay, so this is his cloak. Not the dog. It's covered in blood. We don't know what happened. This beast had just attacked him. Your son is dead. So then nobody's going to go after Joseph and try and rescue him. They've um, they fixed their problem, right? Mm-hmm. They don't have to put up with the with that upstart um, youngest but one brother trying to be in charge of all of us. But Jacob, or sorry, Joseph hits Egypt, and he's sold to Potiphar, and Potiphar notices that Joseph is actually pretty smart. <laughs> And he's a pretty good leader. So he puts him in charge of all, he makes him his administrator, basically. He kind of works his way up the ranks and he suddenly he's, he's running everything for Potiphar um, until everything comes crashing down. Um, and um, he's accused of fiddling with Potiphar's wife. Um, there's, that's a messy story. We're not going to go into that one today. It could be a lot of things going on there. But needless to say, he ends up where? Jail. In jail. Joseph's in jail. And um, in jail, he's, he ends up sharing a cell with two of Pharaoh's staff people, the cupbearer and the baker. And guess what? They have dreams <laughs> dreams and they're like what do these dreams mean and Joseph's like I know <laughs> I'm good at this <laughs> so he tells um, the cupbearer that he's going to be restored in three days and he tells the baker oh you're going to get one <laughs> probably doesn't make him popular with the baker but uh, the ba- it happens <laughs> in both cases it happens so the cupbearer goes back to Pharaoh, and he's restored to his position. Does he help um, Joseph? Probably not. No. <laughs> he lives him sitting in prison for a long time until what happens? Pharaoh has his own set of dreams. That's right. And what are Pharaoh's? Um, Pharaoh can't figure out what they mean. Can anybody else help him figure out what they mean? <laughs> He's got all these wise advisors. They're like, we don't know what that means. But then the cupbearer is like, bing, 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 bing. There was this guy in prison, and he could interpret dreams. So they call in um, Joseph, and Joseph tells Pharaoh, does anyone remember? There's going to be seven years of, of plenty and seven years of famine. And if you do what I tell you, save up the food, you'll all be fine through the the famine that's coming. And Pharaoh's like, thank you, thank you, thank you. He's so grateful that somebody can help him out that he puts Joseph in charge of this project. Mm. So he's restored. He's pretty powerful now. He's in charge of making sure that all the food fills those granaries. And then when when the famine hits, then he's the one that's in charge of basically rationing out the food. So, uh, jump back to the family that was um, left behind, and they're not in Egypt, so they don't have this wise planning, and so they're stuck in the middle of the famine. But they've heard there's food in Egypt, so they send off a committee of the brothers, <coughs> minus Benjamin, 
um, to go ask for food because there is no way Jacob is letting his other favorite son go, right? He's, he's holding on to him. But he sends the rest of the others and said, go buy us some food. And who do they have to ask for food? <laughs> Joseph. Because he's in charge. But what happens? Do they recognize him? No. no. Mm-hmm. Because it's been about 30 years. He was a kid. Now he's in charge. He doesn't look like a shepherd anymore. He looks more like an Egyptian sort of um, administrator, very high up. They, they don't recognize him at all. So um, Joseph does recognize them. And so he thinks, I'm going to mess with them. <laughs> this is my chance to get back. And I am going to play with them as much as possible. He pulls so many shenanigans. He says, he, he, he accuses them of being spies. He says, you have to leave, you, you need to get me Benjamin? They're like, well, how are you going to do that? So they, he sends them back. He keeps one of the brothers, Simon, as a, as a kind of a, a ransom for them showing back up. But then he sends them off with food and also <coughs> sneaks in the money that they brought to buy the food. So now they're worried. Oh, my gosh, they're going to think we stole this money. They come back. They have Benjamin. They, he hides a cup in Benjamin's bag so that they can then say, oh, this boy tried to steal. Now I'm going to keep him. It's, it, it's, it's like he's, he's really milking it for everything <laughs> he can get out of them. Um, but finally, something happens. Because when he says he's going to keep Benjamin, um, Judah says, oh, you can't do that. That'll kill our father. He will die of grief if he loses another son. And um, Joseph breaks down. And he, he cries and he says, don't worry, it's me. It's your brother. And um, I forgive you. And um, if, you, if you bring our father and our whole household and come here, you'll have a place to live and you will be fed through this famine and um, you will have lands and everything. Um, and um, yeah, wow, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're shaking your head. Like, that's a lot. We'll, we'll talk awesome. about that in a minute. And so there's the reunion. This is the reconciliation. Here's um, Jacob and Joseph meeting for the first time in over 30 years. And remember, Jacob thought he was dead. Jacob thought he was dead. Wow. What a powerful moment that is. Um, a family that was split apart is now reconciled. So that's kind of the whole arc of what we've been talking about um, that is behind that story. And it gets us to where we are at this moment. Um, It wasn't easy. Can I say one thing about the faint heart? What I really like about it also is off to the left of Joseph is is his respectful people, his Egyptian respectful people. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I think... You know, it's sort of like, I've made it, you know? And he has a wife yeah. and some children. So I don't know if that's meant to be his family or his his um, <laughs> staff <laughs> or whatever. It's an it like Yeah, and it's, it's definitely... And you know, and he's, and the pyramids are <coughs> in the distance. It's yeah. just a it's really yeah. beautiful... Um, and he's definitely impressive, definitely impressive. So um, there's that opening line to our psalm today. Oh, how good and pleasant it is when brethren live together in unity. I mean, the psalm makes it sound so simple. But as we dig into this story, and if we think about all our families and all the families that we've known, it is seldom that easy, right? I mean, part of why this story is so appealing is because it feels like families are sometimes. I mean, think of the character flaws and misdeeds of this story. And they read like a litany of the failings of not just these 12 brothers, but of the family that we've been following since right back in June that started with Abraham and Sarah. Um, because what do we have? We have like jealousy, rivalry, that, like I said, recipe for disaster in a family, parents playing favorites, and pitting the siblings against each other, plots to seize status, threats, 
retaliation, violence, and then um, Susan. Plus, how many of us wanted to sell our brothers and sisters in? <laughs> it's always the youngest one that you want to sell, right? <laughs> I do remember our, our middle one had to share with our youngest. And there was this point at which the, the middle one was 13, which means the youngest was like seven. And he just couldn't bear to have to share a room with him. And he would go around and 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 um, want to like hang out and play in the side yard, and the youngest one wanted to play with him, but he wouldn't be loud, so he'd watch, and he'd be like, "He's looking at me! Make him stop looking at me!" <laughs> right? Yeah. You're absolutely right, Susan. <laughs> none, we, none of us actually did anything about it, but we thought about it, didn't we? <laughs> so this family has issues, and they're issues that go back generations, and yet some how these 12 brothers managed to find reconciliation together, even after all of that awfulness that has passed between them. Now, um, if we just take that little piece that we read today, Joseph kind of comes off as a saint, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. But you can see by going back into the story that he actually torments them, I think kind of mercilessly first. Any one of those shenanigans that he played it could have derailed things entirely. Because you know, you can see those brothers thinking, oh, he hasn't changed. He's still arrogant. He still thinks he's better than us. So why does why does Joseph change course? I think the answer is in that uncontrolled weeping that just breaks forth. I mean, I, 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 I'm sure each of us can think of a time in our lives where we've just been overcome, and we're sobbing, and it just, it just, everything comes out, right? It's cathartic, and it's hard, but it's out of our control. So I was asking myself, why has Joseph finally lost it, and what is it that makes that spark of mercy finally sort of crack him open? So I look back at what comes right before this, and um, I think there's two possibilities, or a mixture of them both. Because Judah, one of his brothers, does that thing where he offers himself in the place of Benjamin. He says, take me, don't take Benjamin, because I'll kill our father with grief. Because Joseph is suddenly faced with the possibility that one of the villains in his own story is doing something selfless. Something selfless to help someone that, that, that Joseph actually loves, an act of sacrifice. And that messes with his entire sense of who his brothers might be. And then I think there's a second piece too because Judah reminds him that, um, that Jacob might not survive that grief of losing another son. And Joseph suddenly realizes he can't have his father back and take his revenge. He has to choose one or the other. So I think that's what brings up this mix of feelings of love and betrayal all spilling out in that weeping. It's weeping so loud that it can be heard like in the other room, right? It's, it, he tries to hide it from the servants, but it doesn't work. They can still hear him because he's crying so much. And he, um, he chooses to stop his elaborate ruse of retaliation and do one of the hardest things that anyone can ever do because he sets aside his anger. And I mean, let's, let's be honest. That is anger that he certainly was entitled to because his brothers misused him and betrayed him cruelly. But he decides to forgive them. He decides to save his family from famine and offer them a new home there in Egypt. Hannah Garrity, who's the um, artist that does the line drawings, like the one that we have today, um, says forgiveness is an act of cleansing, an act of cleansing. And I love how, if you look at the picture on the front of our cover today, which is one of hers, 
you can see how the lines of the tears that are running off of um of this is meant to be joseph and benjamin embracing for the first time but the the lines of their tears they kind of roll down and blend in their um we don't actually have that one in the set <laughs> it's on the bullet it, but everyone should have it on the bulletin but they blend in to the lines of their figures and then they start to merge across each other it's it's it's, um, it's cleansing both of them those tears because the reconciliation is not just healing what is broken but it's allowing them to start afresh allowing them to start afresh and at this point, I want to step back because, like I said, we've been on this long journey. And if you're with us for the first time, we've been following the stories of um, this family, starting with Abraham and Sarah since June. They're in the um, track A of the lectionary for the summer. So we've decided to, to look at all of them. Um, but I want to step back and think about this journey that we've had with Abraham and Sarah, Isaac, Rebecca, Hagar, Ishmael. Jacob, Rachel, Leah, and now their 12 sons. Because through this journey, we have heard stories of faith and encounters with God, about surprising gifts that come when you think you're, you've given up, about moments of despair when you found that God was near, about blessings that come even when you are so mired in strife. But there's God helping you find another way. Times when you um, didn't think you could make it through, but God was there with them. And even times when people wrestled with themselves and their failings, and they found that God was willing to be with them as a sparring partner. St. Paul tells us today that by the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. And isn't that a neat summary for this family saga that we've just completed? Because God shows them grace and mercy over and over and over again. And what do they learn? They learn how to do it too. They learn how to do it too. And it reshapes this family. But Paul has one more thing that's really important for us to hear today because Paul says this is not just a story of special people from a long time ago. This is everyone's story. God's story is our story, all of our story. God's never failing presence, God's blessing, God's compassion and love is every bit a part of our own fraught and flawed human stories, just like it was for this family a long time ago. As we move forward from today, we're going to start to dig into some of the stories of Jesus and how they talk about our own um, faith stories and journeys and ways that we might meet God. Um, but before we step into that new sort of phase, I, I want to close um, with the words of um, a Scottish Presbyterian minister and hymn writer from the 19th century. His name's George Matheson. He also was blind for, uh, he lost his sight at about age 17, so he was blind through almost all his adult life. And this is one of his hymns. Oh love, that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe that in thine ocean depths its flow may richer fuller be. O oh, joy that seekest me through pain, I cannot close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain and feel the promise is not vain, that morn shall tearless be. O oh, light that follows all my way, I yield my flickering torch to thee. My heart restores its borrowed ray that in thy sunshine's blaze its day may brighter, fairer, you all know God with you in all that you are and all that you do. Amen.